Okay, in this video, we're going to be proving the vertical angles theorem. Now, the vertical angles theorem is most often stated very simply as vertical angles are congruent. And up until now, we've been referring to this as the vertical angles conjecture, because up to now, we've just been uh, assuming that that statement is true, even though we have not proved it. Well, we're getting ready to prove it right now. So, in order to start out our proof, we want to state our theorem, the vertical angles theorem, in this given proof format that we use for proofs. So our given statement is angle 1 and angle 3 are vertical angles. And notice we also have a picture over here. The picture is uh, also considered to be given information. So angle 1 and angle 2 are vertical angles, excuse me, angle 1 and angle 3 are vertical angles. And I can see that angles 1 and 3 are vertical angles in my picture. And I want to prove that angle 1 is congruent to angle 3. So let's take a look at how we're going to do that. We're going to start off doing this as a two-column proof. So there in your notes, you have your two columns, statements and reasons, and you actually already have all of the statements in the proof laid out here in the statements column. And you can see there are going to be a total of 10 statements in this proof. So let's fill in the reasons for each one of these statements. Statement number one, angle one and angle three are vertical angles, and this is given information. So our reason here is going to be given. Almost all the time, the very first statement in a proof is going to be given information. Now the second line of this proof says angle 1 and angle 2 are linear pair angles. And I can look over here in my picture and I can see that, in fact, angle 1 and angle 2 are linear pair angles. And the reason that I'm going to be giving for this statement is also, I'm going to say that's given information. And now you'll notice this information wasn't actually given to me in the given statement of my proof here. It wasn't given here, but it is given to me in the picture that accompanies this proof. So angle one and angle two are linear pair angles. That information is given in the picture. Statement number three, angle one and angle two are supplementary. How do I know that angle one and angle two are supplementary? Well, I know they're supplementary because they are linear pair angles and that's the definition of linear pair angles. Remember the definition of linear pair angles says linear pair angles are adjacent and supplementary. So that's how I know angles 1 and 2 must be supplementary. Statement number 4. The measure of angle 1 plus the measure of angle 2 equals 180 degrees. Well how do I know that the measure of angles 1 and 2 the sum of the measures of angles 1 and 2 equals 180 degrees. I know that because these angles are supplementary and this is the definition of supplementary angles. So my reason here is definition of supplementary angles. And now I've got statement number 5. Now, notice that statement numbers 5, 6, and 7 look very similar to statements 2, 3, and 4. In fact, they're almost identical, except that I'm using slightly different uh, angles in my statements. So, you might expect that the reasons for these statements are, in fact, going to be very similar to the reasons for statements 2, 3, and 4. In fact, they are. In fact, they're going to be identical. Angle 2 and angle 3 are linear pair angles. Here's angle 2 and angle 3. How do I know that angle 2 and angle 3 are linear pair angles? Because that information is given to me as part of my proof. So angle 2 and angle 3 linear pair angles, that's a given. Statement 6, angles 2 and 3 are supplementary. How do I know that they are supplementary? Because that's the definition of linear pair angles. And the measure of angle 2 plus the measure of angle 3 equals 180 degrees. And how do I know that? Well, again, since angle 2 and 3 are supplementary, they must add up to 180 degrees. That's the definition of supplementary angles. Okay, so let's stop here and I want to draw, get you to draw a little box around these three statements here, 2, 3, and 4, and also 5, 6, and 7, just to kind of highlight the fact that these three groups of statements are 
very similar. In fact, you know, they're, they're identical, except in these three statements, I'm talking about angles one and two. In these three, I'm talking about angles two and three. All right, let's go on to statement number eight. Statement number eight says the measure of angle one plus the measure of angle two equals the measure of angle two plus the measure of angle three. And now, it might look like at first that this statement just kind of comes from out of the blue, but if we'll take a look at statement number seven here, draw a circle around that, statement number seven and statement number four, and kind of look at these two statements together. Statement number four says measure of angle one plus measure of angle two is 180 degrees. Statement seven says measure of angle two plus measure of angle three is 180 degrees. Well, if I just take this statement here and I kind of substitute it in here, that is, if I look at this as an equation, this part equals 180 degrees. Since this is equal to 180 degrees, I can take this and I can substitute it for 180 degrees right there. And so what I'm using is the substitution property of equality to make this statement. Substitution property of equality. Remember, the substitution property of equality just says that if two quantities are equal, as they are here in statement number seven, I can substitute this value for this value in another equation. And that's all I'm doing, substituting this value for 180 degrees in this equation. So now I have that measure of angle one plus measure of angle two equals measure of angle two plus measure of angle three. My next statement, number nine, says measure of angle one equals the measure of angle three. And I can see that in this statement up here, if I were to subtract the measure of angle two from both sides of my equation, then the measure of angle two would go away on both sides and I would be left with this. And that is the subtraction property of equality. And in fact, if we were doing this as an equation, then I would write minus the measure of angle two, minus the measure of angle two, and those would go away and I'd be left with measure of angle one equals measure of angle three. Well, now I'm practically done. In fact, a lot of people might stop at this point and say, well, once you've shown that the measure of angle one equals the measure of angle three, that's essentially the end of the proof. You've shown that these two angles are congruent. I'm gonna go ahead and write one additional statement down here, which so just so that it matches exactly what my proof statement was. Remember, my proof statement was I wanna prove angle one is congruent to angle three. So I'm gonna go ahead and write that last statement just like it says in the proof part of my proof. And angle one is congruent to angle three. This is just the definition of congruence. In other words, if two angles have exactly the same measure, that means they are exactly the same size, then those two angles are congruent because that's what, congruent, that's what congruence means for angles. It means angles that are the same size. Now, in your notes, you also have, on the back part of your notes, you also have this exact same proof in flow proof format. And you'll notice that all of the same statements that are given here in two column proof format, all those same statements are given in the flow proof, statements one through 10. Now what I want you to do is I want you to go and fill in, in the flow proof, I want you to go and fill in the reasons for each one of these statements. And we will talk some tomorrow about the flow proof and why it's laid out the way it is.